Women's Deacon. No, oh, Women's Deacons. Women Deacons. That's what it is. Three, two, one. Female Deacons, Women's Ordination. Apparently, it's all the rage amongst those who presume to be Catholic but are actually modernists. So today, we're going to look at the history of of women's ordination, so-called, and this whole idea of women deacons, deaconettes. What do we call them, Tim? Everybody likes to say deaconess, but then Deaconette, the feminists comedi- don't even like that. Comedians, deacon, deaconettes. How about deacons? Like a deacons E-N and an E-S. with a Z. Yeah. Let's call deacons. them nothing. Yeah. <laughs> let's, yeah call let's, them. let's call them undefined. <laughs> uh, undefined. Empty set. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting when I was doing the research for the book, the St. Gala Mafia, one of their punch items is women deacons. This Cardinal Martini, who's really the Don, he's the godfather of he the St. Gala Mafia. Uh, he was about women deacons. And it goes back to altar girls, and people don't like us talking about that, but we got to talk about it. And it's what we call gradualism. You know, you don't just say, hey, we want to female for Pope or female Cardinals, you have to start, it's a slow roll. Right. Right. Yeah. Incrementalism, gradualism. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's boiling the frog slowly. And that's yeah. what other purpose could, what, what purpose does an altar boy have? It, it's basically to show the liturgically speaking, the altar boy around the altar and to begin helping the priest so that just to help discern vocations. That's right. What, yeah, what purpose then does an altar girl have? Yeah. Yeah. The altar boy is a apprentice. You know, we don't really think about apprentices anymore, but if you go back in the history of church or Europe, you know, if you want your son to be a blacksmith when he's 13, 14, he goes to the blacksmith shop and starts working there for free. It's basically trade school. It's like right. college. And he learns how to heat the metals and the different kind of metals and to braid the metals and how to make a sword and how to make a horseshoe and all that. And, you know, hopefully one day he inherits that shop or he goes to another town and opens up a blacksmith shop. Well, same thing with the priesthood. You get some young men in there and they give it a shot. They try it out. You don't like it. You want to get married. Great. You do want to be a priest. Here's the path. So and you look at what an altar boy does, even in the Latin mass. It's pretty complicated. It's impressive to see these 11 year olds reciting the confidior, reciting all the responses, hands together, right angle turned. I mean, they've got these guys trained amazingly, but it's not rocket science. I mean, I have seen faithful priests in small situations like retreats and whatnot. They're able to say mass without an altar boy. It's not ideal. It's not that great, but the altar boy is not of the essence of the mass. It's an add on. Sure. Sure. You know, when I was an Episcopalian priest, they did the slow roll. They started with the altar girls. Then they did the women deacons. Then they did the women priests. We used to call them priestesses. And then they did the bishops. We used to call them bishopettes. Bishopettes. Full takeover. But they did it gradual. They did it gradual. You have to. Mm -hmm. That's that's, that's the only way to do it. I mean, what... Again, so there's no purpose when you ask, that's how gradualism works, is you don't ask at each increment or each new step, uh, you don't have an interlocutor asking, what's the telos here? What's the, what's the end game? Yeah. And if you do, then the game's up. The only, you, you can only boil that frog in water. If you, if you ask, if the frog were able to ask, I guess, a uh, fairy tale frog, gone awry he ends up it's in the, a prince not kissing it's the princess prince. but yeah he's a prince he's not kissing the little the little princess or whatever he he winds up being uh, boiled alive if he could ask if he could speak and say to what temperature are you turning this puppy uh you know then then the the, the jig would be up yeah. but since you don't ask you know if if we continue not to ask well what again people you're saying people don't like the fact that we're ragging on altar girls but what's the purpose right we'll do yeah. something if they if it serves a function a telos and an ergon but it doesn't so mm-hmm. why not why not uh jettison it? it doesn't serve a discernible function that would be recognized as good by the universal church it is serving a function they keep it hidden and the function yeah. is the subject of today's show yep i want to i want to drop some 
some science on everybody here, as we used to say back in the what did we when was dropping science? Was that late eighties, Tim? That's yeah, early nineties. Is it early nineties? Right? Yeah, I think maybe maybe late eighties or yeah. very early nineties. It's like yeah. pre tribe quad yeah, it's like, tribe yeah. called quest, right? Like somewhere yeah, around there, during, ninety during or tribe during called okay. quest. Yeah, right, I'm going to drop some science here. This is um, Benedict the Fourteenth, not the Sixteenth. Renewed the prohibition against females serving at the altar with this statement: "Quote, women should not dare to serve at the altar. They should be altogether refused this ministry." End quote. Hmm. It also refers back five century earlier to Pope Innocent the Fourth, who said the same thing. And they refer back to Pope Gelasius, Pope from 492 to 496, who also condemned any women serving at the altar. Drop the mic. So why do we have girls serving on the altar? Well, you Don't. know, why? I mean, if you ask the fathers of the Amazonian Senate, any of the Germans, they're, they're, they're all but articulating it. Already, yeah. you know, the church will quote never be the same again after this Amazonian said the frightening, frightening language uh, that we've our ears are strangely enough growing accustomed to. How do you how do how does one grow accustomed to language like this? We're hearing it every six months with either a synod or some sort of uh, darkling gathering, uh, official or unofficial, in Rome. That's obviously the purpose. This is what the, the, the next step in this thing is. Women deacons, de deacons, uh, after altar girls, and of course the terminus is women priests. And well, we said in our previous show, I can't remember if it was you or me, but the terminus, the telos to this whole thing, is Monsignor Luigi and Monsignor Mario, gay sure. lovers, open in the congregation in the parish. That's God, Mario, Mario, Monsignor Mario and Monsignor <laughs> Luigi holding hands at the back door of the church, greeting people. That's in, the end you know, game. In, a, in some red overalls and green overalls, Mario and Luigi. <laughs> That's right. uh, yeah, no, no. So that would be the that would be, I guess, the. You can have a series of final causes. You're right. That's that's yeah. more the cause behind that's the, the cause. remote that's a, final cause. That's the remote final cause. The the, the, the final cause of the girls qua girls yes. would be, or maybe maybe it's only the formal cause. The formal cause of the girl, girls qua liturgical servants or whatnot is first the altar server, then deaconesses, and then priestesses. Uh, but yeah, they don't really care. Well, I mean, the one thing that liberals in the church don't give a damn about that we know is the liturgy, right? No. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they don't care about the liturgy. They don't care about the liturgical form. So they don't care about adding a liturgical form, which you can't do anyway. Yeah. The only thing they care about is not allowing the old stuff. They hate that. They'll mock it. Because the old stuff is a, a categorical uh, preclusion of whatever you're calling the remote final cause, remote right. final causes where they want to take it. Homo heresy stuff. I mean, like, like we talked about a couple shows back, right? Yeah. All of the earliest heretics, maybe more serious heretics because they're more of in violation of the first commandment about God's, you know, uniqueness and his unicity alone. That might, that might make him angrier might be more sacrilegious by itself. But what you could say about those first heretics, you know, the 400s, guys like Arius. We don't often stick up for Arius on, here on TNT, but <laughs> one thing that can be said is it, it, it might or might not at least have been a, an intellectual error, you know, that is just made for, for the, on the basis of an intellectual error alone. This sexual stuff. Everything yeah. in the church now from uh, leading up to and away from Amoris Laetitia, April 8th, 2016, is all, you know, centered right on the loins of human yeah. beings. It's just trying to make all, all manner of sexual perversion okay. And that, that's, this is no exception from that rule. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we hear, you know, the early Gnostics uh, were given to sexual vice, the... Uh, Manichaeans were given to sexual vice. The Albigensians were given to sexual vices. 
part of their heresy was sexual license. But you don't ever hear the father saying Arius is getting it on with some dudes or he's got a <laughs> har- harem of chicks yeah. that, he, that he travels with, right? Presumably it was a dogmatic debate. Now, let me say, denying the divinity of Jesus Christ is way worse than, you know, sexual sins. But sure. now... I led with that. Yeah. yeah, 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 you led with that. But but now, like you're saying, everything is... they. And if you ask anyone about, you know, the sexual, you know, the, the James Martins and the Caspers and all these people, they don't even really care about the Nicene Creed or Arianism. No. They just be... No. They, they think Muslims are part of the people of God. Jewish people right. are part of the... Atheists are people... I mean, for them... Dogmas don't even matter. It's a piece of paper on a desk. Right. There's something there's something to all I was saying, of course, it's it's maybe more offensive to God. I I think I think it would be hard to argue that it's not more offensive to God to deny the Trinity. It's so so um, ontologically, you know, it's the ontological basement to all the other theology that follows fundamental theo and all that. But what's especially despicable about tweaking faith and morals the, the actual moral theology of the church to befit one's own life is that it isn't just an intellectual error. This is, I, I guess I'm rephrasing what I said earlier. Right. Same, same idea rephrased. With, I mean, I don't see outside of a, an egregious intellectual error made by Arius and then tons and tons of sort of progenitors that repackaged Arianism for the next 300, 250 years. You don't see a lot that's in it for for him. You know, it's just a stupid right. heresy, and he, he was um, contumacious in his errors. He was yeah. in an error of contumacy. He he stuck with it. Uh, we talked about how difficult it is um, to for the church to condemn you. They really make it easy to back out. So I'm not defending him. I'm just saying, with the sex sins. It's not just who knows. Maybe Arius was a perv in his private life. I, May have been, but he wasn't trying to say that he, it's okay. Now these guys are taking sexual perversions that have been agreed upon, signed and sealed for for nineteen hundred years, and then yeah. starting about nineteen hundred years into Christianity, saying maybe this is okay. Maybe we can maybe we can uh, reverse this teaching, even though we're not allowed to reverse teachings and and can call it dogma. It's yeah. it's especially it's wicked because it is the it is the unforgivable sin of of um, hypocrisy, right? Do you want your cake? You want to do the wrong thing and eat it too. Whereas if Arius was doing a dude on the side to to use your term, or had a harem of chicks, uh, <laughs> also uh, it's, my it's, unfortunate term. <laughs> <laughs> quoting you're quoting Shakespeare you. is that Hemingway doing a dude on the side? Uh, if he's harem doing that, chicks. then he's just. He's willing. There's something. There's Mm -hmm. one thing noble about it. Nothing in the act. Yeah. But what's noble is I'm willing to pay for this. He's not overturning justice itself. Hypocrisy, you're trying to overturn justice itself. And that's what's behind female deacons, female altar boys, female priests is it it really is all leading toward the, the general blending of the sexes in Catholic teachings so that you can. You blend the sexes, like what people today call genders, and then you blend the sexual acts so that there's no clear moral teaching on them, I think. Yep, yep. Speaking of, you know how Arius died? (laughs) No, no. (laughs) I got a video on this, everybody. You should pause this video. Go watch my video, Taylor Marshall, How Did Arius Die? He was going to communion in Constantinople. The emperor had just said... He's going to receive communion. He told that to the patriarch of Constantinople. The patriarch of Constantinople prayed to Jesus and said, I cannot give Arius communion. He's a horrible heretic, heresiarch. So either kill me or kill him. So the next day, Arius and all of his followers were coming into Constantinople to the cathedral. And all of a sudden, Arius had a little grumble in his tummy. And he's like... (gasps) I got to go to the latrine. Where's the latrine? So they pointed to a public restroom nearby. This is a documented story, folks. He went in there and he never came out. And they're sort of embarrassed. Like, where's Arius? He went in there and he had a prolapse, dude. 
his guts came out and he died on the toilet. Wow. Yeah. How, what causes that? I, I don't know. Maybe sure. yeah, maybe he has some problems there, but. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but there's no, I've never heard I, this. in the video. Go watch my video, folks. How did Arius die? There's a two part video. First part is on Arius getting punched by Nicholas, I think. The second part is on Arius dying. And there are Byzantine icons of Arius <laughs> I, on the pot. Uh, I've seen those. Like I going, didn't get ah! it. <laughs> like one of them is hair yeah. standing up and he's dying on the toilet. And so the I think it was his name was Saint Alexander. It wasn't Alexander of Alexandria. It's a different. But that archbishop prayed that Arius or he would die and Arius died That's on the, the toilet. Day. Yeah, that kind of prayer is totally, totally holy. Right. If Love there's it. a yeah. heresy arc, you kill him say, or hey, kill me. Kill Kill, kill him I'm or, not giving or, that guy communion. Unlike our hierarchs today, who give communion to all sorts of people who are teaching and living. Parasiarchs. Yeah. Yeah, living the wrong when stuff. When you first so. said you had a two part video on it, I thought you were saying you had two parts to the video on <laughs> on just him going to the bathroom. I was like, that's got to be a lot of detail. Yeah, yeah, got, wow. Yeah, I've got a five wow. hour treatment. No, these are like yeah. eight minute video, right? It's short, right? But yeah. One part. It'd be something I've had a TNT on. And I I think I read somewhere that eventually the Orthodox (laughs) had to tear down that latrine because it actually became a site of veneration for Arians. (laughs) Wow. For Arians or for for calf? I mean, I think for Arians. It's kind of holy for both of them. They're like, this is where he died, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Yeah. Dropping. It wasn't pretty. Yeah, not good. (laughs) Dropping science. (laughs) Bad science. <laughs> so, anywho. Wow. Yeah. That's, no, I didn't know that. I, I yeah. want to know what he ate. Uh, make sure well, not to eat that. Yeah. He swallowed some lies. He swallowed. Came yeah. out the other end. That's right. All right. Well, so we should pretty. talk. We're going to talk about deacons, women deacons, and we're going to go through the whole history. We're going to talk about the Bible. Were there women deacons in the Bible, as some people say? Um. Pope Francis was on the airplane. Was it yesterday? He's on the yeah. airplane. He's done. Dropping yeah. science, as he is wont to do. And uh, he had some things to say about women deacons. He was asked, I'm going I'm to read some, some portions from this uh, thing. So someone asked him, hey, what's the story with women deacons? And Pope Francis said that many scholars worked on this. There was a commission to look into female deacons. I think that's what we're supposed to call them, Tim, not women deacons, female deacons. Okay. So on the question of female deacons, and the Pope said, they they were all different, all toads from different wells. Mm. I got to give him that. He's got some some, uh, colorful language here. So people have different perspectives. Everyone thought differently, but they worked together and they agreed up to a certain point. But then each of them has his or her own vision, which isn't in agreement with the others. And they stop there as a commission. And each one is studying on his or her own to go forward, end quote. (laughs) This is kind of like just saying any anybody that writes their own paper, like we agreed about some things. Yes. We disagreed about others. Yes. Others, we sort of disagreed and sort of it's like, cool. Right. What he's saying is not that bad, though. Which is yeah. rare. That's 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 unique here on the show that we're yeah. we're quoting Francis. We're not like this is bad. I mean, it's right. not that it's not that catastrophic. Yeah, I read this and I was like, oh wow, I'm not you know worried. It's basically he's saying it came to a gridlock. There was no agreement. You know, he could have said, well, we all came out and agreed there were women deacons and we're at the Amazon Synod. That's what we're going to do. Surprise. But he didn't. Right. Now he said this. He goes on. He says this, and this is a little bit more interesting. He says. Um, the commission did find, quote, there were deaconesses in the beginning, but it's difficult to know whether it was sacramental ordination or not. They See, helped. That, that concerned me. Yeah. 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 They helped, for example, and we're going to argue today, folks, that it was not sacramental ordination. It's pretty obvious. But anyway, here's Pope Francis. They helped, for example, in the liturgy of baptism, which was by immersion. When they baptized a woman, the deacon, deaconess assisted. So 
many people don't know this, but in the early church, baptisms were done by immersion. You went into a baptistry and you were naked. No clothes. You came out of the baptism and they gave you the white gown that you wore as a neophyte. They anointed you with the chrism and they gave you the candle. We see all that in the traditional baptism. Well, if you got a naked woman, there is like a sheet held up and the bishop did it or the priest did it. And then the women helped anoint with the chrism because you're dealing with the naked woman here. They also assisted with the anointing of the woman's body. Then a document came out that showed the deaconess was called by the bishop when there was a marital dispute for the dissolution of the marriage or the divorce or separation. When the woman accused her husband of having hit her, the deaconesses were sent by the bishop to look at her body for bruises so they could testify for judgment, end quote. I'm sorry, it goes on here. What is fundamental, the Pope explained, is that there is no certainty that there was ordination with the same form and finality as male ordination. So I actually like what Pope Francis said here. Me too, aside from the fact that there's there's nothing in true untrue about this statement, but it's it's vastly, I arguably infinitely understated. That's like saying there is nothing certain to evidence that there's such a thing as a circular square. It's like, well, yeah, not only are we not certain that a circle can be a square, we're circle that a circle can't. We're, we're certain that a circle cannot be a square, right? We right. This I've never seen this as disputed, even in. I'll give you an example. The my 11th grade uh, textbook we use, which is not particularly orthodox on other issues. I believe the publisher is our Sunday visitor. Mm. Uh, the, the textbook is called The Church Through History. They make very clear, I always appreciated this, in this chapter, in the early church, the Acts of the Apostles Church, that such deacons who happen to be female, you, you can you can go through and I know you did a little research on the actual uh, the Greek. It was the word like lowercase h helper, right? So right. they use this word, but like like Susanna and Joanna were considered helpers, deacons in right. this first generation of apostles, the apostolic era. But even the the book from our Sunday visitor says these were not ordained deacons. There's no doubt about it. And I thought that's nice that they say that to the kids, even though high school kids aren't looking for an aperture the way that leftists sure. in the church are. They wouldn't be thinking that, but they're like nipping the problem in the bud. They're like, by the way, they say deacons, but this is not, you know, third order right. ordination or whatever. Yeah. 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 Because here, here's how they, for those of you that haven't actually been in these arguments and discussions, here's how they, here's how they go out. Women should be ordained deacons because we see them in the early church. Well, is it sacramental deacons? Is it holy orders or not? Eh, it doesn't really matter. Let's just have women deacons because we need female ministry in the church. Even if we grant them that they're not really sacramental, we'll accept that. Remember, it's gradualism, right. folks. Right. Then, because this is how it went in the Episcopal Church. Then you've got these women deaconesses. And then they started saying, well, you know, there's really no difference between a deacon and a deaconess. They should wear the dalmatic. They should wear the crossway stole they should read the gospel and liturgy because now you're being sexist yeah. because you know it's the same job they should have the same roles so same then they title. push that yeah and then they say well you know deacon is a sacramental order and you say wait i thought you said back then it doesn't really matter like well it is a sacramental order and we have the same sacramental order as you guys have we women deacons as right. the male deacons and then everybody kind of shuffles their feet and they're like okay there's women, real sacramental deacons. And then you wait three years and then you say, hey, if there can be sacramental holy order deacons, there can be holy order sacramental priests. Right. And right. you do that for five or ten years and then you raise it to bishop. That's how it goes, folks. Yeah. That's the game plan. And if and if there's if if uh, given viewer listener out there suffers uh Incredulity, you know, they're just I okay. I I get the theory, like like Taylor Marshall, but you know, I don't buy it. I, I understand it; it's an intelligible theory, but I don't think that's actually how it plays out. Then, well, there's there's not quite anything for that aside from the fact that just consult history. This is how it's been done 
really aggressively over the past 50 years for every change that's been made. This is how communion in the hand works. Yep. This is how non-kneeling communion works. This is how a bunch of the changes to the forms in the liturgy worked. And there are even even if you look at the, the changes that you're always talking about to the breviary, um, more and more there, there's an element of gradualism even to that. It wasn't all just um, – one change. I, I'm trying to think of changes from the 50 years previous to the last 50 years. It's it's also just human nature, right? It's mm-hmm. evidenced by both history and what we know a priori of human nature. Gradualism works. Think about, uh, uh, you know, Gandalf and the door the dwarves in uh, the Hobbit, right? When they go to Bayorn's house, he's like, okay, we have 14 dwarves here. Let's just I'm going to introduce you two at a time so he doesn't lose his temper all at once. It's yeah. gradualism. It's boiling it's a frog deep. in water. Yeah, yeah. And you look well, at who are the people advocating for female deacons. It's guys like Cardinal Martini, who wanted ecumenical masses. He wanted Protestants receiving communion. He openly rejected humana vitae. It's like contraception right. is fine. Follow your conscience. Lax on abortion. Group absolution. No more private confessionals. All this stuff was part of the San Colin Mafia agenda, Cardinal Martini's agenda, very open about it. Even subverting John Paul II in the open on some of these issues in the late yeah. 80s. So you can say, I don't really follow you guys. This is, you know, this isn't really it. But look at the look at the suspects. Look at Protestants. Protestants caved on this and all of them have women's ordination. Right. And yeah, that's the other mark of gradualism is any time. Well, I told I've I've mentioned it on the show before in law, we call it hollow out. Anytime there's a little, little tear in the fabric, it will get hollowed out because all you do is you poke through the little pencil first then you can put your finger through. Then eventually you can put your fist through one little exception, which makes bad law for this reason. And Mm -hmm. the whole fabric is is thrown asunder, you know, torn wide open. One question we've never really ask here on TNT in, in at least the terms that I, I, I would ask you right now is, but, but I think very interesting and enough ground to speculate. What, what is the terminus from the perspective of the St. Gallen Mafia of this Bergoglio Pope Francis papacy, right? Because we, we quoted, you know, on probably at least five shows that they said there was one Buenos Aires bishop or archbishop, I forget what he was when they started meeting in 1996, who would serve the goals of the St. Gallen Mafia, and his name was, you know, Bergoglio. What was the goal? After after Morse Leticia came out in 2016, I thought, okay, this was it. You got, you got mm-hmm. one big, you know, uh, increment accomplished, and now he's sort of out and out you know, an opponent of at least some major solidified church teaching, whether or not it's dogma or anathema or whatever. But now they're going for more. These are other little increments or other sizable increments, not little increments. What's the goal? I mean, I the thought goal, it was to get the goal is clear. We got to go back to Alta Vendita. In the Alta Vendita, it specifically states that we get a pope after our own heart who promotes Freemasonic goals. If you hear Freemasonic and it freaks you out and you're like conspiracy theory, okay, just scratch that word and put in the word secularist goals. The brotherhood of man, the equal distribution of goods, communism, religion as rational and non-fideistic. All religions are equally right and they're equally wrong. It's, they, they use this kind of language, like you go to a classroom and you tell a bunch of five-year-olds, draw a picture of God. And some of them draw the sun, some of them draw Jesus, some of them draw a field. Some, the Hindu kid draws a cow or something, you know, like everybody does their drawing. And then you post them up and then every, the parents come in and smile. Oh, it's so cute. That's how Freemasons or secularists look at religion. They're all equally wrong and they're all equally good. Everybody gets a pat on the head because ultimately they're all pointing to the same thing, which is what? Love of other people getting along to go along. Right. 
That's it. Love of man. Yeah. Love of man. There is nothing transcendent. There is nothing true breaking from above into our world. All we have is the horizontal. Absolutely. That's all we have. And so so that's the end game. That's the end game. I meant with specific reference to this pontific. I mean, I think now that they've gotten one, I mean, Francis is not young by any stretch of the imagination. I think now that they've gotten one and they've, they've accomplished a couple big things from their midnightly yeah. point of view. The goal is to get more, right? I mean, I don't think they remember also from the Alta Vendita, they say one soldier dies in the struggle and the next one takes his place. So I think their next, wherever the midnight, uh, the, the, the St. Gallen Mafia is having these midnightly meetings, they're probably like, okay, who's the next guy? Who's up next? Because Francis is oh, how old? Sure. 885. Sure. No, they've got it yeah, back so up I mean, in the pocket. What, how much – I'm wondering specifically – I thought after Morse Letizia, it's just me, that, okay, he's out now. He's out He's mm-hmm. out of the closet as a modernist. And after Morse Letizia in April 2016, of course – conservatives took a while there's some weird lag time for, for yeah. really the red pill to kick in the red pill didn't kick in for uh almost two years the red no, pill really kicked it, in it for a lot of kick, people it didn't kick in until 2018 right yeah. right it was last summer yeah that ever it was weird because i was like i read it april 8th i remember where i was sitting on my couch i was like this is everything i suspected he was. i mean i was always suspicious like Marge says of, of Bart, like one little boy never lost his distrust. That little boy in this case was Tim Gordon. I was like, OK, I know. I knew it. But I was shaking my fist for the next at least year, year to year and a half, mm. waiting for this to settle on people. It settled last summer. So fine. Better late than never. Got it. Everyone who's on the right side now is on the right side now. But not I necessarily. Thought, Let's remember our, you know, our Jimmy Aiken has, has been battling all week. Yeah, but he's on the right side. I, oh, I, mean, I know, but I'm I mean, I don't. but I mean, he represents Catholic Answers and Catholic Radio, and you know, it's still in 2019 a social media feud over Amoris Letizia and and all these things. Like, you mean among even non non communists in the church? He's, cert- he's certainly he's yeah. certainly not that. He's yeah. not a yeah. yeah people I mean, listening to Catholic Answers or on the way home from work. Right, are hearing a lot of the stuff for the first time. And, no, it's true. And Jimmy Aiken is trying to shore it up, but the dam's broken, man. He's it's one no of the longer, stragglers. Yeah, I, I mean, mean he's he's putting I, all of his th- fingers and thumbs in the holes of damn right. things blown open. Come well, on, Jimmy. It's, it's come a, on over, Jimmy. Come on, the cowboy come hat. On. Come on, man. Come we'll on. We'll take you. Better yeah. late than never. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Come on, Jamie. Well, I mean, did you, yesterday he's saying, you know, kind of similar argument to the Susanna Joanna argument about communion in the hand originarily. Yeah. I mean, taken in the proper context, you know, none of these arguments, let's go back to resource of law, original sources, all that. It's like in the proper context, it vindicates everything that I don't know what you call them traditional minded people in the church have been, we don't, we don't have to say rad trads cause that, that gets all, that has the tincture of politics, but just come on over to the side where you're, you're comfortable making critiques of whatever contradicts the logos. How about that? How about putting it that way? I like that. We'll take you. No one's gonna, some of our good friends that we've interviewed on this show, we've interviewed lots of people. Some people have been there all along, like yep. the Skojex and the life sites. They, they've been there pretty much before you know, before during the synods, when I was reading it, I was getting it all from Scotia. They were the hipsters, man. They were against it before it was cool. No, I know, I know. Yeah. And I, I was with hipsters. them, but I, I only, I was, a, you know, I was just kind of reading silently, publishing the occasional thing on like crisis. But they were the hipsters. Then you had some, some really on top of it people that that really kind of came out um, vis a vis the Pope, not the other bishops. Later, like this summer, like our, our buddy, our buddy Voris, it's like, it's timing doesn't matter. Everyone yeah. takes their own time to process things. Just Jimmy Akin, Catholic Answers, come on, come on. The, you guys have done a lot of good work for a lot of good people throughout the years. And again, let's let's put aside the differences between the clans. Just just get get right yeah. with God Don't, on these issues. Look, you it's know. 2019. Jimmy Akin and Catholic Answers. You can't right. say everything the Pope says is orthodox. I mean, going back to Eric, here's what Jim, here's the Jimmy Akin argument. All these things can be interpreted as orthodox 
Ergo, they are orthodox. No, 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 no. That's not a good argument. Arius and his friends claim that what Arius was teaching could be interpreted in conformity with the Nicene Creed. That was their big argument. And the church says, yeah. no, you're a heretic. So just because it can be doesn't mean that it is. I'm sure we can spend all day long and make Luther and explain away all these things Luther said. Hours and yeah. hours, like Catholic Answers Live doing it. But that doesn't make Luther orthodox. Just because you can do it doesn't mean it is. And so that's just got to go. Bye. It's got to go. Bye, Felicia. It's too, too- the hour is late, you know, like the, the, the sun is, is both risen and set on the, the Francis pontificate where faithful Catholics ought to be saying like, oh, it's Pope Francis said today. And they're, they're laudatorily like, you know, trying to just say it like as if this is a non-controversial source for a quotation. It's like, even if you quote me, hey, Pope Francis said there are three persons in the Trinity. I'm like, what? Okay, I have to double check everything here now because of the source. This yeah. is how human beings work. This is how the human intellect works. So I, for, I forget where that got us. But yeah, the Susanna Joanna argument, I was actually surprised not to find it in a more robust adversarial form in the, out of the mouth of Francis. It, it was a welcome little yeah. surprise, I guess. Yeah. All right, before we get into the, we're going to look at the Phoebe, Romans, Susanna, Joanna, church fathers, and all that. But we have to just say at the beginning, why can't women be ordained? We've been assuming it, and now we have to explain it. I'm just going to give you the argument of Thomas Aquinas. When the priest says at the altar, this is my body, it's not Father Chuck or Monsignor Bob (laughs) saying that. It's in persona Christi. He's in the person of Christ. So when he says the word my there, it's not referring as normal. In normal grammar, if I say, this is my microphone, right? I'm talking about it's in my possession. But sacramentally in the mass, when he uses my, it's no longer Monsignor Bob. It's Jesus Christ. And bodies only come in two versions. They come in the male version and the female version of the body. Therefore, the minister of this great mystery of transubstantiation must be male. That's it. Yeah. This is my body. It must, if it's a female, because remember, Christ is the groom, the church is the bride. It's a nuptial relationship. It's the wedding supper of the lamb. So, In the liturgy, the bride is being united to the groom. If the priest or priestess is a female saying, this is my body, female body, and offering it to the church, feminine, you now have sacramental lesbianism happening. (laughs) That's bad. (laughs) <laughs> okay. I like how you added that's bad. Yeah, just in, in case, case, just sacramental in case. liturgical lesbianism isn't uh, recips eloquent or bad. Yes. That is bad. I that like is bad. Yeah. So because that's of this, not good. priests can only be male. Now, someone will say, oh, well, that's just because in the old days, patriarchy, you know, excluded women from everything. No, look at every pagan religion has female priests, priestesses. The Romans had priestesses. When St. Paul and Christ our Lord and Peter were walking the earth, all those religions they were encountering had priestesses. It was actually part of the culture to have priests and priestesses. Female oracles, Delphi, all these places. It was Judaism in the Old Testament and then Catholicism that said, no, the priest represents God. God is the transcendent. He's the masculine. Creation is the feminine. Mother nature. And so the priesthood is always male. That was unique in antiquity. So it's not yeah, because Catholicism was conforming to culture. It was actually countercultural in right. having male only ministry. That's per- perfectly, perfectly said. I don't know if as a co-host you say that to one other, but that's perfectly said. I mean, I'm writing this feminism book right now, and that's the exact. Uh, that's you got like a title for this feminist book? We're we got to start. It, we got to start calling some. Titles, no, no Christian feminism. 
And oh. so here's why, just simple, like straightforward. You can have a chapter on women's ordination. Person. You should. It'll be part of. It should be part of chapter three, which 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 my bro is handling. Uh, my okay. my actual brother, my literal brother, David. Um, uh, yeah. So he's he's doing kind of the, some of the the heavy lifting um, ecclesial ecclesiological chapters, hmm. but but exactly like you said three minutes ago, there has to be a connection. There are two points I want to make on, on the, uh, the heels of what you just said. Number one, there's always a connection between Christology and ecclesiology or, or else every time or else nothing we're doing matters. Yeah, that has to be like, so like you said, Christ is the bridegroom. The church is his bride. This is, this is something we want to take Almost literally, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what the proper distinction there would be, but we don't want to just be symbolic about it. Like Saint Paul in several of the letters is, is talking well, we about. We could say we could say it's analogical, and we could use Fourth Lateran Council twelve fifteen to say that Christ is more a groom than you and I are grooms to our wives. Right. Right. Good. So and, yeah, and logical, yeah, we, that, Christ isn't participating in what Tim and Taylor are to their wives. We are participating in what Christ is to the church. Precisely. So precisely. Christ's groomness, his bridegroomness, is prior to ours. Right. Right. That's what the, that 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 Thomistic analogy, just the the level of an the analogical modes of reasoning are yeah. the only way to conceive of real aspects of, of being. This is why Thomas Aquinas is the first doctor in the Catholic Church. It's, it's amazing stuff and fun to read if you have an appreciation board. But the point is to, to, to strip it all down. It's Christ is the, the bridegroom. Oh, there he is. I'm just going to hold this up now from, for the rest of the show. Like, yeah, okay. Now put it in front of your face. Yeah, I could cut um, out a little mouth hole here. Yeah. You know, what's up? Huh? That would be, that would be a hell of a thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it boils down to um, if you accept the scriptures, the letters of St. Paul, everything that's said there about the relationality of, of men to women. Actually, I'll conflate my two points. So I'll just make one point. Christology and ecclesiology, we have uh, priests that don't speak in the nomen de Christi, right? They don't speak in the in the name of Christ. They act in the person of Christ. That's right. That's what it, it, it's, it's, not it's a type of a placeholder. Oh. No, it's not nominalism. It's an ontological placeholder. The priest is in the person of Christ. Maybe under nominal, uh, you know, just the, the name of Christ, you, there are probably other theological errors, but maybe you could make this argument. In the person of Christ, maleness matters. Jesus is part of the Trinity, yes, but he himself is a fully human man, was male. And... Um, you have other evidentiary things that don't prove it, but are highly evidentiary, like, you know, 12 apostles, they're all men, even though he, he loved Mary more than he loved the apostles, but he still picks all men. That's evidentiary. That's not a yeah. proof. The proof is when you pick a man to act in the place of a man, then there's that's what we're calling a priesthood, you know, a an actual priesthood of ecclesiology. Um, when you pick the vocation of ordination. When you pick the, here's the second proof, when you pick the vocation of matrimony, then we're called the pre, men are actually called to be priests of the ecclesiola, the, the church miniature. Okay. And father. so the same relation. That's what we call father, him father. Yeah. 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 That's why we call him father. That's why you call your father, you know, priest, dead, church father. Well, analogically, a man who's the head of a household, he's a householder, relates to his flock wife and kids as a priest does to his uh to his flock and mm -hmm. and there is a headship there which means you know the human head is is the the center in a way and all of these strains of feminism you know it gets me when when conservatives and christians alike say oh they want to characterize everything that's bad about feminism as being part of extreme feminism or radical feminism it's just part of feminism right yeah. egalitarianism is wicked and the, the connection between Christology and ecclesiology proves it. There is no exactly. there's no equal. Instead of saying, let's try to look at what we can, have some study groups, you you do your research, I'll do mine, we'll all say things partly the same and partly different, or whatever Francis, however he phrased that. Codes in a different well. Right. 
why why study what we can to show how similar men and women are? What if we approach it from the opposite angle and said, let's study how different men and women are. Let's study why are we studying the question of female – why should females be deacons, altar boys, or dare I say priests in the first place? There's no good ground for it. Yeah. So, I mean, this is kind of like saying let's, let's spend um, thousands of man hours studying – whether or not we can we can square a circle. No, why are you doing that in the first place? Squares yeah. and circles are like opposite things. Men and women are so different, so radically different in our souls, not just in our bodies. The bodies express a, a, a formalistic difference in the soul that we do not, that, that it's strange that people would be putting this proposition under so much uh, scholarly you know, light of scrutiny. You're wasting yeah. your time. We're utterly different. Right. Ain't nothing but a thing. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. That's, that's how you have to approach people when they're like, what about this? Here's what Catholics need to get used to saying. Egalitarianism of all sorts, I'm, I'm quoting Thomas Aquinas from the treatise on law. It's evil, right? Yeah. If you equalize property among the masses, well, you, know, you, you get rid of all kinds of ar aristocrats. He says, this will destroy justice in society. Yes. If you equalize, to quote Plato and Aristotle, if you equalize the sexes, you're going to get gender dysphoria, which is what it wound up in with us. And you're going to get disharmony in the family, uh, you know, divorce everywhere. And there has to be a clear head. We would never yes. consider even the liberalist, most radical, uh, uh, you know, opponent of the, of the civil society. I've never heard say that the military should do away with all hierarchy, yeah. right? No should more be generals. When there's a war going on, they should all huddle, huddle together under all the bombs dropping and be like, okay, who wants to charge? Who wants to go right? Who wants to go left? Right. No. Right. Vote. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's go left. All right. Yeah. Six out of 10 say go left. We're going left. No, you can't. Think about football. There's what, right. if the quarterback or what, and the coach wasn't calling the call, calling the shots and it's like, we're going to vote amongst the linemen what I should do next. Right. You got 40 <laughs> seconds to call a play and it's like, well, no, no, no. And then they're, they're like, okay, but I want to, I want to, I, and I have many friends I know you do as well that try to run their marriages like this that yeah. are like, well, we split everything between us. I'm like, yeah, me mm -hmm. too. I mean, this is my best friend I'm talking about here. It's like I'm having to define, do the metaphysics of what it is to really, truly be married to your best friend. That's true. So we don't have to discuss. I mean, most things we can just discuss rationally. But if there's a disagreement, it's the fundamental radical difference of a man and a woman. We know which way it's going to go, right? It's just that's like, right. well, well, I'm the leader. I have the higher rank. Yep. That's just how, that's how just it be. That's how it goes. But except men are like literally like, no, we talk everything to a conclusion. This is as – outrageous as mm -hmm. um, what you said about you're, you're huddling under a boat with bombs going off over your head and you're like, okay, we, okay, we're going to, we're going to get a symposium and we're going to decide whether to flank left or flank right. right. It's like, we'll die. No. If the exigency is a life, if you married the right person, you're going to agree most of the time, That's but right. you, even when you know, don't, human marriage, yeah, you will yeah. not every Here time. Here at TNT, we're dropping bombs today. People are going to get mad. The husband has the final say. It's not debatable. It's Go not read debatable. St. Paul. It doesn't matter Go whether you're St. Catholic Paul. or Protestant. Even the Protestants, the Protestants are better on this than most Catholics. They actually, because, because they follow the Bible. Because they follow the Bible. The Catholics don't read the Bible, and they just have Father Feelgood uh, giving the sermon, which has redacted language they in took all the, of the they Pauline took the, letters. The passage that we're talking about, they took out. In fact, it used to be in the traditional wedding, you heard that. Now they've yep. cut, it's optional. You can cut it out in the modern Catholic wedding. So optional you tell Catholics this and they're like, that's not in the Bible. Up. Well, yeah, it's not in the Bible you heard at the Novus Ordo NAB because they snipped it. Yeah. And we're not just talking Ephesians 5. Ephe well, you're, you're talking Ephesians 5 because it's got a liturgical place. St. Paul and like nine other places. Yeah, I've first Corinthians. This stuff. Yeah. First Corinthians. First Corinthians is a starker statement of it. Well, yeah, Ephesians that's where you've got 5. the head veiling and the male headship. Right. The man is the head right. of the wife. So these are all passages that the modern feminist and even your modern Catholic squirm. There's people hearing us talk right now and they are squirming. They don't like hearing what we're saying right now. But I'll tell you this, people, everyone I know who has a happy, holy marriage with a wife who is thriving and happy and in good shape 
and moving forward in life has a strong husband that she trusts. The husband is the oak. You want to find happy Catholic wives, you will find the oak of the husband. You want to find miserable, unhappy wives, you'll find a flimsy, non-oak husband. Yeah. Or just someone that's, dare I say, if we if we scour the ranks, if we widen the net even a little further, and you, to borrow some language from Miley Yiannopoulos, who published my book in its first edition, literally like... You want to find someone that, that bought even a little more into the feminist rhetoric. And you're talking about 38, 42-year-old woman that, that bought into this stuff and lives in a small, cramped apartment, bought they could have it all. They have a cat they hate. They have a group of friends they hate. They haven't, you know, they haven't yeah. done what they, they know in their heart of hearts they've been invoked to do, a lay vocation, to get married and have kids and find a good man and, and honor him or whatever. Uh and, and, and it, it makes for it's the path of misery and lots, lots of poor souls have been duped into this, this form of life. And it's, it's really bad. But I think it's first and the, Corinthians. And, and there's oh, before you and for the men out there, you know, you may be thinking your wife wants you to just whatever you say, honey, whatever you want to do, honey. And just the appeaser husband. She doesn't want that. She wants to be on the adventure. She wants she wants you to set up an exciting life. And she's part of that. That's Someone exciting. And out, you're in control. Yeah. Like you're, the life and the finances and the house and the kids aren't a disaster. You have provided a matrix and a grid for life to flourish and be fun and exciting. Yeah, I, I don't. Someone, one of our listeners will correct us, but I'm really glad you said that. I forget who who's considered. the. It's not Rush Limbaugh. I'm talking uh, 15 years before Rush. The guy that's considered he's a secular Jew old guy. I think he might've passed away in the last four years. He's considered the godfather of AM talk radio, really smart dude. Okay. I listened to him a little bit in San Diego. I'm forgetting his name, but I heard one of the greatest segments of talk radio was this old dude. He was like 85 at the time when he was saying it. And he said, husbands that are yes men to their wives that have, that are, they're supposed to be in command and they, they gave it up to their wife. It's unfortunately most men nowadays he said they're not they're not even suffering from and he's not he's not catholic so he doesn't understand you know charity in the, in the christian sense yeah. yeah headship he he but he's just saying this from natural wisdom he's saying this is not charity even though it might look a little bit like an overabundance of meekness or something he said all it is when these husbands refuse to chase their wives refuse to be the leaders is self-service and mm. particularly it's sexual self-service, right? Mm. They're looking out for their own sex lives is what he right. said. Right. You're putting in, you're not, they're not willing to put in the time up front to create, to, to not create, to abide the hierarchy that nature set forth. That's right. And I mean, he said a bunch of other great stuff, but it was amazing. So it might be Pat might be his first name, but I I've, I've tried to look him up before and without the name, I can't find him. Really amazing. It applied that the natural hierarchy is such it's 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 wired into nature such that it's not a choice everyone acknowledges it one way or another we're just trying to say let's not let our um abject failures to acknowledge it uh, end up affecting liturgical ecclesiological forms i mean that's right. Right. that's what we can't do at this point that's right yeah and, and we have people now who think the catholic church the wife can go ahead and on her own authority change the rules that Jesus set up for his church. Right. And isn't right. it interesting that it's about matrimony is the main debate. Surprise, not a surprise. Right. Yep. And th th there are really good stats that um, Pew Research does some of these statistics and the Brookings Institute does some of the other ones, even though not, neither of those are far right wing in institutions, uh, think tanks or whatnot. But one of the statistics um, is, is very stark. It shows even in terms of what, what the kind of functionality that we'd be talking about with deacons, right? Teaching, you know, helping to teach instruction, speaking at church, which St. Paul does address this, doesn't he? Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a uniquely male function. And yeah. one way you can tell is uh, there's a study done on 
families, which might not be divorced families, but when only one of the parents is Catholic, when only a father is Catholic, it's like 90 percent of Biden's. The kids don't fall away. Low attrition yeah. rate. If they the father is really on fire, attending mass. they stay. Whereas with both, it's like the same. No offense, ladies. It's like the same whether it's both parents. It's like 90 percent. Whether it's just the father, it's like 90 percent or something yeah. really close, like 88 percent. If it's just the mother, boom, plummets. Why? Because of nature, because man is the priest of the household. What happened with right. my generation and yours? Um, who was taking the kids? Most kids didn't go to mass, you know, over mm. half. But the kids that did go to mass, who was dragging them? It was our mothers, yeah. right? It was our mothers that were like, no, come on, being the chastening voice. That's not believable to young men or young women. Mm. God bless our mothers. They're doing the best they can. And, and we're for get all the emails. mothers watching doing that, thumbs up to you. We're not denigrating. Good, good job. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, I wasn't trying to sound like I was denigrating it. It literally is all she can do. Is, I mean, because what are you going to do? Not observe the – sometimes, like you said last show about lamentation, you just do what you can do even though you know the numbers are against you. That's right. If you have a, a slouch husband that's not going to church, not doing his first most duties, more important than providing – Have him watch this even. video. Have him watch this video. Yeah. If you're a slouch, this is worse than not going to, to, yeah. to work, right? Yeah. If you're not getting your family to mass – then this is worse than not going to work. So what would the yeah, wife do? And by do? the way, can... and by the way, guys, if you're that guy, shame on you. Shame on you. Yeah. yeah. We don't respect you. Well, it's not only do we not respect you, but this is this is literally the the biggest failing. You're failing at the end game of life, right? Yeah. The reason that one gets married, just consult your catechism, is to procreate life as abundantly as you can within educate. your situation and Educate and educate. Thomas Aquinas and, and that, always does procreate and educate. Educate, exactly. And you see that exactly. in the Catechism of Trent, too. Boom, boom. Exactly. Procreate, educate. And, and somewhere kind of entailed by both of those, sacramentally goes along with just living and, and education right. means you got to foster what you've learned to get your sacraments. It means you gotta you got to be getting to Mass on Sundays. It's, it's an obligation, and you have to be talking about it. You have to have enlivening discussions. But start out just getting to Mass. Um, if the kid only sees a mom that's kind of devout, then it's like, oh, that's kind of a girly thing. That's the message yeah. that's directly seen. Whereas if you see your dad every morning on his knees before he goes to work or, or some something like that, it's very, it just sends a totally different message. Why? Is that because men are better than women? No. Men are just better leaders than women. Same as women are better birthers than men, right? They're better, better birthing mothers. kids. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're better mothers than men. Men are better fathers than women. Um, this is indisputable stuff. And yeah, this this might turn controversial. There's yeah, no need this to YouTube open video your Bible. Is gonna, this YouTube video is going to get flagged, Tim, but I don't care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Watch your title. We found we found late last fall, come November, when when you know he was titling these. That sometimes we'd be talking. What what do we say about this? The, the title matters. The, the title box. matters on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, they scour the title. Yeah. If I put oh, for, feminist in this title, it'll be blocked. Get out. Flagged. Get out. Gone. Yeah. That's why I'm gonna have to put yeah. deaconess in the title. No one. <laughs> the YouTube bots don't know what deaconess means. What, what Taylor, what, what is the St. Paul passage? It's not first Corinthians and it's not Ephesians five. I'm forgetting it now. What is the one where he talks about the people that allow women to teach in church? That's first Corinthians. That's first Corinthians. Yeah. Is that later or is that site? Uh, let me pull it up. Can we read that? I mean, that seems yeah, yeah, highly, yeah. highly relevant to what we're saying about the deaconesses. Yeah, let me I, find I don't it think here. people know that. I don't think people – I'll speak while you're finding it. I don't mm -hmm. think people know out there that as part of inerrant, infallible scripture, how much of this stuff yeah, is here just it is. You ready to drop science? Do it. First Corinthians 14.34. Mm -hmm. Let women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted them to speak, but to be subject as also the law saith. So they shouldn't be give, given talks. They shouldn't – it shouldn't be up there. I don't care if it's Mother Angelica should not be up in the pulpit doing the teaching. Uh, that's so just do, infallible word of God. First Corinthians yeah. 14, 34. Uh, I know red pill for some people here, but 
This is Christianity. This is Catholicism. And again, you can't say it was cultural because in the ancient days, right. priestesses were teaching the people. They were right. consulting the female oracles, the sibyls, you know. It's a strong corollary, the fact that people say, well, half the time leftists will make this point. They'll be like, well, you, did you know that all these other cultures have it? It's like, yeah, that, that's what, what yeah. I say. That militates against the conclusion you're trying to defend. But what I was laughing, right, as you read that is because it's so strong, very strong, and so categorical. I mean, uh, if you have it up still, it's probably worth repeating. Yeah, I'll, it's I'll so read strong. It again. Why do we just do an hour show on this? Don't listen to us. Just go read the yeah. inerrant word of go God. Go read Ephesians and go read First Corinthians and First Corinthians 14. I mean, First Corinthians also has everything about head veiling for women covering their heads. That's that's what yeah. I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah, that has some strong language. But 1 Corinthians 14 says, verse 34, let women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted them to speak, but to be subject as also the law saith, end quote. 1 Drop Corinthians mic, 14, dude. 34. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. You know, another interesting thing that we haven't ever mentioned is the second pope was named Linus, St. Linus. I talk about him in my book, The Eternal mm -hmm. City. All right. He only, history has him doing one and one thing only in his pontificate. Do you know what it is, Tim? You're mm -hmm. going to love it. He decreed that women must veil their heads in liturgy throughout the entire Catholic Church. Oh, That's wow. That's the only thing on his pontificate that we have in history. That's his decree. His contribution to Christendom <laughs> was he said that women should veil their heads hair in liturgy and churches throughout the church. Second Pope. Yeah. Wow. Wow. St. Linus. Not the Snoopy. Or is it Snoopy? Linus and Snoopy? Yeah. Peanuts? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not that Linus. St. Linus. Different one. So, there. Okay, so should we go through these deacon passages, Tim? Sure. I, I think we yeah, should. Race, I think maybe we should. race through them. Yeah. yeah, so um, you already mentioned Luke 8, 3. Before we ran tape, you're like, yeah, Joanna and Susanna aren't deacons. I'm like, who's Joanna and Susanna? I've never heard them called deacons. But you were referring to Luke 8, 3. I looked it up. I still didn't see how it was a deacon passage. Then I read it in the Greek, and I right. saw why people say so. So here's the passage in English, Luke 8, 3. And Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod steward, and Susanna... And many others who ministered unto him of their substance, end quote. If you go into the Greek, the verb there, so this is not a noun, like they were deacons or deaconesses, but the verb is the verbal form of the term deacon. So it's diakonon, diakonun, sorry, diakonun. You can hear the word diakonon in there, right? So they were deaconing to Jesus. Now, we need to understand that diakonos and this verb, it literally means to minister or to be a servant. So if someone came and was like clearing your table and bringing you food, that would be deaconing, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, dia means through and the cone is almost like common. Just it's through the common, just doing common work. So deacon mm -hmm. is not like a fancy word. It's just, hey, I'm a servant. I'm doing common work. I'm ministering to people. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they are ordained deacons. Yeah. I mean, we talked about in another show in Romans 13, St. Paul refers to Nero as God's diaconos. Right. Right. This is Romans uh, 13, 4. The king is God's diaconos, working for thy good. If only thou dost wrong, needest thou be afraid. For it is not for nothing that he bears the sword. We talked about this for the death penalty, remember? Right, right. He is God's diaconos still to inflict punishment on the wrongdoer. So this is a great passage because we have the state can bear the sword and kill you, capital punishment, as taught by St. Paul the Apostle. And Paul was referring to the king, and the king at this time is Nero, as a diaconos, a servant. This doesn't mean that the Roman emperor is a deacon. Ordained. Nero? Ordained. Neronian? He's using yeah. the word deacon, but he's using it in a general way. Same right. with uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Paul refers to himself and others as deacons. Well, obviously he's an apostle, 
but he's also saying, I'm a minister of the gospel. And then the big one that everybody brings up is Romans 16, 1, where Paul says, and I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is in the deacon, it's hard to translate, in the deaconry of the church that is in Centre. So Jerome translates that as in the ministry of the church. Some people say she's being called a deacon, but here Paul uses sister in the feminine, Adelphane, but he uses deacon in the male, diaconon. So this is why it probably shouldn't be translated as deaconess. It should be translated as in the ministry of the church. Yeah. Right. In the more generic translation. So even in scripture. Now, another thing is I... I saw this last year and I had always assumed they weren't lying to us, but they were. There's a guy, Pliny the Elder, and he Mm -hmm. talks about torturing to deaconesses. And I'd seen this quote a lot. So I looked it up in the Latin and he says, um, yeah, that he tortures two deaconesses to find out more about the Christians. In the Latin, it is ancile que ministre, ministre ministers in the latin he doesn't use the word deacon but all these feminists translated into english as deaconesses right but it doesn't say deaconess in the latin it says ministers so that's a dead sneaky. quote sneaky yeah. sneaky yeah i just found that out last year for all those yeah. years of seeing that quote that's why i gotta look up stuff in the latin and the greek because people trick it right right well, tricks in the well, 200 200- surprised- oh go ahead yeah, I was I was just surprised that that this my center center left um, church history textbook I've already said it what right. uh, earlier in the show was so honest they they kind of go two three sentences out of their way to say oh these are not real deacons these are non sacramental I was like dang good for you that's where I learned about Props. Susanna Joanna Phoebe yeah yeah it's just a repeat though. Um, I was just going to say in the 200s, we have this document that's from Syria, the Didascalia, no, not Didascalia, Didascalia, is that right? Didascalia? Didascalia. I don't know. Teaching of the Apostles. It's oh, Syria. No, yeah. not the Didache. It? No. It's the Didascalia. Oh, something else. Yeah, I'm not sure where to put the accent on that. Um, but it talks about a ministry for women. And it's noteworthy that when you hear people say, oh, there were deaconesses in the early church, 90% of those cases were in Syria, not in Greece Mm -hmm. or Mm Egypt. It's a Syrian thing. And I don't know why that is, but it seems to be concentrated in Syria. Also interesting, if we should remember that the Syrians tended to be, even in the 200s, is it encratites? Is that a tough term? I might have the word wrong. But anyway, they were they taught that once you were baptized, you could never have sex, even if you were married. That baptism was continence and celibacy. That was still a big deal in Syria in the 200s. Wow. So, a how bit did they, how did they get, get busted in the pews? Yeah, in some places in Syria, they it's there's recorded evidence that they refused to use wine in the Eucharist, only water. Hmm. Because it was too sensual to drink wine, which would be an invalid mass. Right. So if you Francis, remember, there's a guy named Francis. Tatian who was a disciple of St. Justin Martyr. He actually subscribed to no sex after baptism and, and no wine in the Eucharist. Hmm. So that being said, I don't really want to trust these people on women deacons either. Yeah, Just I was going to ask you in the, the the Francis remarks from the the pay, uh, plain presser. He mentions this actually. That in, he does that mention uh, Syria, doesn't he? Syria. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. said. I mean, again, this is less politically charged. More seems to be aside from that one sentence, which is sketchy. Seems to be more research driven. This is this is rare. It's a little breath of breath of air, I guess. Even yeah. though he said. He could have said it stronger that there's no way that that any of these bona fide researches turn up women ever were sacramental uh, or, or ordained deacons. Yeah, yeah. 
So I just checked. It's Encratites. I had it right. Encratites is the name of the heresy. It's a Syrian heresy. And it basically says... You just can't have any fun. You can't drink wine. Yeah. <laughs> You're married. You yeah. can't have relations. Right? So yeah. it, it, was, it was the belief that when you receive baptism, you are called to the monastic life hmm. is the idea. Uh, and no, no wine, nothing sensual. So it's kind of Manichaean. It's proto-Manichaean. Right. Um, and maybe there was Manichaean influence in Syria. And we do know that the Manichaeans in a lot of these Gnostic sects did have female ordination. So it might be the case that Syria in the, in the 200s is being um, influenced by these quasi-Gnostic or full-out Gnostic teachings. That's not, didn't, isn't this where Augustine, Augustine went and met Manny? Isn't this where he found it? It was near uh, the Syria. He didn't, he didn't meet Manny because Manny's pre him, isn't he? No, yeah. he met him. He went and he met him. No, I think Manny died in, uh, when did Manny Let's die? Look, it up. look him up. This is where we he, need um in confessions like he says he met him. Unless it was like his his close I am No, because Manny Manny dies in two seventy six. Two seventy four. So I mean Really? See. Yeah, yeah. I thought he died in like four seventy four. Okay, no. so who did Augustine go meet? He went and oh, met one of the Manichaean bishops. I think it was Faustus. Oh, uh, it was Faustus. That never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Augustine so goes. he was a yeah, Manichaean was cleric. He was but the head Manichaean cleric. Or he however may have been their like one of their top dogs. Yeah. They're, they're top, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll introduce you to our best man. Yeah. 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 I mean, he was really, really underwhelmed, right? I, I mm -hmm. mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not as an Augustinian the way I'm going to tell him this, but yeah, he, was, he, he met him. He was totally underwhelmed. And then when he ended up meeting Ambrose, he's like, this That's is better. This is what I'm talking about. This, this is, is the smartest this is man alive. I, yeah. Faustus yeah. was like bologna sandwich. And then he met Ambrose. Did, this is ribeye. Yeah. 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 And I what's interesting that. is because I just opened up the Manny page here that most of Manny's works are preserved in Syriac Syrian. Yeah. So I, my guess is that the Syrian Christians are influenced by Manichaeanism. And so yeah. they have women deacons, women clergy, and they've got, you know, these weird um, prohibitions against sex, which the Manichaeans did but didn't depending on your level so it's probably something to do with syrian heresy and not anything to do with actual catholic christianity because you don't see it at all in in rome or you know mainstream parts of the church right and it's cool that pope francis grants that sure um sure. one one final here is uh the Council of Nicaea refers to deaconesses in the context of heretics. This is Canon 19 of the Council of Nicaea, first ecumenical council. With regard to the Paulinists, Paulinists are heretics. With regard to the Paulinists who take refuge in the Catholic Church, it has been decided that they definitely need to be baptized, which means that their baptisms were invalid. If, however, some of them have previously functioned as priests, if they seem to be immaculate and irreprehensible, they need to be baptized and ordained by a bishop of the Catholic Church. In this way, one must also deal with the deaconesses or anyone in the ecclesiastical office. With regard to the deaconesses who hold this position, we remind church leaders that they possess no ordination, but are to be reckoned among the laity in every respect, end quote. Boom, drop the mic, Council of Nicaea yeah, 325. I, so here we see that deaconesses are not in the mainstream Catholic Church. They're in the Paulinists, heretics. If they do come into the church, they want all bishops to know that this deaconess idea is not ordained. They're reckoned, it says explicitly, among the lady in every respect. They don't preach. They don't serve in the liturgy. They don't hold water and wine. They don't read the gospel. Lay people. Yep. I just don't see how anyone can come to us and say, oh, in the early church, there was sacramental ordination for women in the diaconate. No. Bye. Right. So you can't say that it was it's it's an understatement of the year to say it's it's not certain that women can be deacons, which is all Francis said. It's it's actually certain that they cannot. It's the contrapositive yeah. that he should have said. Yeah. 
And the evidence we're seeing for these deaconesses are in the fringe areas of heretical establishments. Right. Not surprisingly. And where do we see people today wanting it? Right. On fringes of heresy. And then I also just want to drop this quote again from Pope Benedict the Fifteenth. Oh, I said earlier Benedict the Fifteenth, and I made a mistake. It was Benedict the Fourteenth. Got to get my eyes checked on the Roman numerals. Benedict the Fourteenth renewed the prohibition: women should not dare to serve at the altar. They should be altogether refused this ministry. That means if you're watching right now and you have a daughter who's an altar server, explain to her she can't do that anymore. Right. Pope right. Benedict the Fourteenth says women should not dare to serve at the altar. Right. Are we going to follow the rules or not follow the rules? <laughs> well, this is the tricky part, you know, and, and it opens up a discussion we can't have in this show because we've already right. gone for a bit. But so what? What the hell? <laughs> I mean, how does this work with you know now now canonically or uh, you know disciplinarily? They are allowed by the, you know, basically every right. every dio- diocese. It, how, uh, how diocese of Lincoln is in That's the true. U.S. That's are true. not allowed. So I did There's one. There is one. But okay, how do you say the 99 percent of the diocese allow it? How do you circle that square? This is there. We're back into the modernism problem. Yeah, I mean, I would just say problem. who's right: your local ordinary or Pope Benedict the Fourteenth. I'm right. going. With the traditional papal teaching. Well, like who's right? Do. Your local ordinary or basically all of these teachings? This is not an exhaustive list, what we've turned up today. That's just literally, you know, what? Well, who's right? Your local ordinary or St. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians, right? Right. When he says women shouldn't be teaching. Come on. Right. Yeah. Get out of there. Yeah. Don't let your kids alter girl. Don't yeah. let them be girl alter boys. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good. I mean, it's. It's confusing for them. It's confusing for everyone else. It's just confusing. We live in a confusing time in the church. Can we please just remove some of the grains of confusion off the scales and tip things back towards orthodoxy, clarity, faith, joy, charity? So we want to fight about one more stinking thing. In contemporary Re- Catholicism. Rediscipline into, conform- into conformity and into harmony with doctrine. That's, yes. That's what we're talking about here. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, that's a show right there. Um, Tim's got his new... Oh, I left it downstairs. I was going to bring it. The, I got a, uh, a new copy of the oh, Catholic sweet. Republic. Looks good. I need you to sign it. Yeah. The signed I- version. Didn't I sign? I sent one to you signed. I signed that. The, the new the, one? The title page. Yeah, the, the new, new one? one. Oh, maybe I didn't look and see. Yeah, I signed okay. that cover. I signed the title page. Thanking okay, you I'll check it. I thanks. I what are you that. having for dinner? Or whatever you sign okay. in when you sign a book. <laughs> uh, so he's got Catholic Republic out. Um, go buy it. Go get go it. Go to Sophia. Sophia. Go to Sophia. Com. Yeah, it's, it's better if you buy it at Sophia. I got Infiltration. It was supposed to come out. In a week and a half, it's now coming but out. But it's on sale. You can still you buy can it. pre-order it. And Sophia. Charlie wants go buy infiltration at sophiainstitute.com. Don't ever, they get bigger shares and they're telling yes. us really Amazon aggressively. Amazon takes a little cut, me. so they like it Is if it? you buy our books on Sophia. Charlie and, keeps uh, telling me that. Yeah, 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 yeah. They like that. They like that. So um, that'll be coming out, and um, I'll be in Rome next week. So. Hopefully no like albinos try to kill me or anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or or anyone. Or anyone. Re- yeah, anyone. At the end of the day, you don't really want to be killed by anyone. Like if no. you're getting killed, you you'll be like, oh it's not, well, at least it's yeah. not an Unless albino. It's an he doesn't have fidei. Pink eyes. If it's an odium fide, yeah. it's yeah. okay, I guess. Um so yeah, so follow us on Twitter. What else? Yeah, yeah, follow us like on Twitter. Like the video. Yeah, they- Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell. Getting all these people saying I've subscribed and I've been unsubscribed. And I've also noticed that Facebook's been throttling a little bit of our traffic. Have you noticed that, Tim? We got frozen 
our our seven heresies video, which yes. I do follow the count the first three yes. days, it got frozen at fifty two thousand yeah. K views just, for about a day. It just yeah, went it like just this. spiked and then it went flatline. It's like how is that possible, YouTube? It's not. Well yeah. it's not. So yeah. if you complain if you yeah, if you have any kinds of problems. I Well then you complain and then YouTube casts more attention to you, which is not good. You know? Yeah. They're they're shutting down all these conservatives. It drives me crazy. I've already been thinking about Plan B when the day comes. Yeah, what is? Well, we'll we'll have to. I, I'm I got curious some ideas. What your plan I got is. some stuff in my pocket. Yeah. Well, it'll it, the show will continue whether it's on YouTube or wherever. <laughs> so all that being said, uh, support on Patreon that'll probably go away one day. <laughs> I mean, but while while it's going. Um, oh, and if you support if you support on Patreon at a centurion level, I'm going to send you a signed and numbered copy of Infiltration. A lot of you already signed up for that. So if you want that, I'll send a signed and numbered hardback version of Infiltration for centurion levels. And that's running all through May. So if you're centurion in May, you get that. So. Cool. That's oh, yeah. It. And then the, the, the other thing, since we're just cleaning house here. Yeah. The book should hopefully be out uh, by by fall. The uh, the feminism book. No Feminist. Christian feminism. This is what I'm working on. So, when I'm so not the title's going to be again. No Christian feminism. It's a working title. You know, Sophia okay. likes the simple titles. Yes. No Christian feminism. We we're thinking I think this is nifty or we're thinking no cross in Venus's mirror. Right, because Venus's mirror is the feminist mm. thing, which uh, looks like uh, a cross. Yeah. No cross on Venus's mirror. That might be a that's, subtitle. That's, they, they like the yeah, that's kind of long. People are like, what? What does that mean? It, it works out well. It works as a good subtitle. Yeah, like I had for go, infiltration. I had like the smoke of Satan <laughs> infiltrating the Catholic Church from within. They're like, hmm. How about infiltration? Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, but they know what they're doing, though. Yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. when I was publishing with Milo's people. I had a really dope long title yeah yeah and they they're like, like how about catholic republic and i was like i get whatever yeah i mean at a certain right. point i don't care well but, it's because when you're on a show like we are right now you don't want to say the 200 year plot to overthrow the catholic church <laughs> with an infiltration from within over and over and over it's just like my new Bro, book infiltration you picked up your copy today of in the 200 year plot of <laughs> infiltrating the Catholic Church from within and from without. Like, yeah. You, yeah, I get it. I get it. Or, like, what was yeah. the one? There's no cross in the mirror of Venus. What? No no cross in, Mina, in Venus's mirror. That yeah, might yeah. be a subtitle. No Christian yeah. feminism, punch. No cross, you know, yeah. colon. No cross think, in Venus's mirror. We, no we don't Christian know yet. And it's, it's co authored, so we have to arm better, wrestle yeah. about what it means. All right. And that's in the fall. Fall. I got a book idea for the fall, too. I'm not going to say what it is. Yeah. So, anyway. Okay. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. Pray the rosary. Oh, for all you dads watching, be a good dad. Man, make life a new adventure for your wife. Be the man. You know? Right. Don't be the guy who on Facebook buys date in a box and then, like, you open it up together and you do a date in the box. Have you seen this thing? No. It's dumb. I'm I'm not on Facebook. You don't know how to take your wife on a date, so you buy date in the box? What is it? It has like, like idea food? cards in it, like where oh. were you when this happened, or like throw the dice and this happened. It's like a improv date. Wow, I don't sounds, know. Sounds sounds, sounds like you should. It sounds like you should be able to think of something cooler than that. Yeah, you know. Well, half these guys are having to ask permission. Is this date okay? Like, this is this is the whole problem. It's like. You don't have to just say, hey, yeah. look, this is what we're doing. It, even if originally the culture is poisoned the mind of the girl you're taking out or even your wife, eventually they'll like it. You got to got to take the uh, the power. But to do that, you have to be a moral leader. Right. Yeah. You, you got to have the one with the other. That's right. You got to be impressive. If right. you're not impressive, it's not going to work. Right. You can't just be like, hey, toots, jump in the pickup. <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. Because <laughs> you got to get there, you know? <laughs> yeah, like Jerry Seinfeld always said, these guys that are just laying on the horn, they're looking at a girl at the stoplight crossing the street, and they're just laying on the horn. It's like, these men are out of ideas. Like, you got you to. Gotta, yeah, that's like TLC, I don't want no scrubs. Right. I got yeah. the passenger side, the side of, of best your best friend ride, ride trying, trying to holler at me. Them? Yeah. All right. Good. All right, guys. Out. 
All right, here's the infiltration trailer. Watch this. 